Hey everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our event. Welcome, thank you for coming. I'm Beth Saunders, I'm the curator and head of special collections and the library gallery here at UMBC. I'm actually gonna take off my mask so you can hear me. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to today's public event honor honoring Shannon Taggart and the exhibition Seance. We are pleased to welcome audiences both in person and via live stream. And I just wanted everybody to know that tonight's event will be recorded and available. So tell your friends, um, you can find it on our library gallery website. For the past 20 years, American artist Shannon Taggart has documented spiritualist practices and communities in the United States, England, and Europe. The resulting body of work, Seance, examines the relationship of spiritualism to human celebrity, its connections to art, science, and technology, and its intrinsic bond with the medium of photography. This exhibition pre presents 47 images from the series, revealing the emotional, psychological, and physical dimensions of spiritualism in the 21st century. This is our first exhibition since the library and gallery closed its doors in March 2020, and I feel that this body of work is particularly relevant and vital to our time when the world is still in the throes of collective trauma and grief. Many of the photographs in Seance address common human experiences like loss and longing, seeking answers, belief, and healing. I'm also struck by how this work engages with the hopeful and creative ways that technology has been and can be harnessed to bridge distance and open minds to new possibilities. Before I introduce the artist, I would like to extend my gratitude to several people who made the presentation of Seance possible. This show was organized pretty much entirely over Zoom <laughs> during the pandemic. So I'm really, really grateful to everyone who contributed to making it such a beautiful and thought provoking presentation. I'd like to thank Emily Cullen for her expert installation of the show and Larry Halver for assisting with hanging the works, which were beautifully prepared by Ethan Jones and Brian Miller. And I'm appreciative of my team in special collections, Susan Graham, Lindsay Laper, Lorraine Ojo Ohikwari, and Robin Martin for their support and their expertise. I'd like to give a special thanks to my co-curator, Anna Wall, chief curator of the Pensacola Museum of Art, who is our co-sponsor for this exhibition. And of course, all the gratitude to Shannon, who has really been an incredible dream to work with. I am really thrilled and grateful um, that she chose us to be the first place um, to present a major exhibition of this body of work. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Shannon. Shannon Taggart is an artist and author based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Her photographs have been exhibited and featured internationally, including within the publications Time, The New York Times Magazine, Discover, and Newsweek. Her work has been recognized by Nikon, Magnum Photos, the Ing Morath Foundation, American Photography, and the Alexia Foundation for World Peace. Shannon's monograph, Seance, published by Folger Press in 2019, was listed as one of Time Magazine's best photo books of the year in 2019. So welcome, Shannon. Um, she is gonna come up and speak, and then there will be time for questions and answers at the end. Thank you, Beth, and um, UMBC, and Anna Wall, also the co-curator, for making this dream come true, seeing seance exhibited in this beautiful form. Um, I also want to thank everybody who came out today in person and everybody who's with us online, um, and friends who traveled in, and a special thanks to Ethan Jones and Brian Miller for um, helping to put together this beautiful show. Um, so, Seance, uh, it, it, it's a culmination of a project started in the year 2001 on spiritualism, the religion that believes in communication with spirits of the dead. And the reason my book took so long to produce, and the, the exhibition is heavily drawn um, from, the, from the book to the, it, it kind of plays off of the, the book as, um, as a work. Uh, the reason it took so long is because I became heavily influenced by the history and aesthetics of spiritualism, uh, but this material was obscure. 
I had difficulty showing my work and um, having people understand it because they didn't understand where I was coming from. I was working in a context that people were unfamiliar with. Uh, lucky for me, this landmark book and exhibition happened in 2005, The Perfect Medium, which sparked interest in the topic of spiritualism and photography. And UMBC Special Collections made an important, important contribution here with the Ted Sirio's Thoughtography images and an essay contributed by UMBC Professor Emeritus Stephen Brody. So um, the book, as, as, um, I, as I put it together, is divided into three parts. First, I wanted to introduce spiritualism's uh, rich visual history. So one of the curators of A Perfect Medium, Andreas Fischer, helped me do this by contributing an essay that frames my work within this context. And he very graciously allowed me to use some rare and never before published images such as this one. And Tony Orsler, the artist and collector, also helped by contextualizing spiritualism uh, in it, and its connection with modern art. And Tony's essay is heavily illustrated with amazing works from his incredible private collection. Uh, the second section uh, is my photographs themselves in sequence without text. And the third part of the book is a deep dive into the stories behind my pictures. And here I am able to show how certain images relate to spiritualist history. But I'm also able to tell the behind the scenes info and I detail some of the spooky stuff too. And I get to share some of the humor and the paradrama that I encountered over the years doing this project. Uh, one of my favorite examples, just a quick example, it involves this picture, which is on display here in the, with the show. This is the medium Tom Morris and he and his partner, Kevin Lawrenson, uh, ran a private center in France called Mont Cabaral. And when I was there, there's all these amazing stories about these provocative seances and they had uh, all these antiques from, from Vivian Lee and all these unbelievable stories. And when I heard, and I heard a lot of unbelievable things and this is all detailed in the book, but when I was told that Tom was the first all nude male stripper in swinging London and he was famous for his naked fire breathing act, I was doubtful. But in my research for the book, I found out that this was absolutely true. Tom was known as the rhinestone cowboy and he was famous for his riverboat cruises on the Thames in the 70s. <laughs> so um, that's one of the gems from the stories of the book and uh, it's uh, one of my favorite parts and I'll, I'll share some more of those stories as we go along. So that's an intro to the book itself and now I'm going to explain how I got here. Uh, I began photographing in the world's largest spiritualist community, Lilydale, New York, in 2001, while I was working as a photojournalist. And I planned to spend one summer uh, making a straightforward documentary about this quirky little town filled with fascinating people who told me they could talk with the dead. Uh, but to my surprise, uh, after that first summer, I could not leave Lilydale because I discovered that spiritualism had an utterly fascinating history. and. This was a story I'd never heard before. Um, these facts were missing from every textbook that I had ever studied from. I want to make the point that you don't need to take spiritualism literally to take it seriously. This is a picture of the Italian medium Giuseppe Palladino, who was studied by many of the most famous scientists of her day, including several Nobel laureates. Stories like Giuseppe's have often been censored from history. There has been a queasiness concerning spiritualism. But however uncomfortable, it is undeniable that spiritualism stands at the crossroads of culture. Its influence echoes in and brings together histories of science, medicine, technology, and art. There is a direct path leading straight from the seance room to the birthplaces of forensic science, wireless communication, evolutionary theory, experimental psychology, gender studies, and even abstract art. So now before I explore spiritualism's truly provocative visual record, and share my own photographs, uh, I want to quickly introduce spiritualism itself. Spiritualism, spiritualism's aim has always been to merge science and religion, and to this day it is described by spiritualists as a science, a philosophy, and a religion. And some may find this fact surprising, but spiritualists reject any association with the occult or, or magic or witchcraft. 
Spiritualists view the practice of communicating with the dead as a progressive act, as scientific, uh, something that's in tune with the laws of nature. They identify as rationalists, as descendants of the Enlightenment, and they seek evidence of their beliefs in many ways, including through experiments with art and photography. Spiritualism is an American-born religion, and it began in upstate New York in 1848 when two adolescent sisters, Kate and Margaret Fox, claimed contact with the spirit of a murdered man buried beneath their home. Their method of communicating using letter-coded wrapping developed into a hugely popular movement that spread across the Western world. And spiritualism not only gave a voice to the departed, but also to the disenfranchised. Reformers and radicals were drawn to the movement. Abolitionists, free love and child rights advocates, vegetarians, holistic medicine practitioners were all part of its development. The women's rights movement in particular was linked because spiritualism was a revolutionary religion. It placed men and women as equal. At a time when it was dangerous for women to speak in public, spiritualists offered their platforms to suffragettes such as Susan B. Anthony. And the first woman to run for president in the United States, Victoria Woodhull, campaigned proudly as a spiritualist medium in 1872. Uh, at the time spiritualism developed, scientists were proving that unseen forces do, in fact, surround us. Invisible communication happened with the telegraph, the telephone, the phonograph. Radiation was discovered. The germ theory of disease were, was proposed. The power of electricity was harnessed. Some of the esteemed scientists responsible for these discoveries also investigated spiritualism, such as Pierre and Marie Curie and Thomas Edison, who worked on a device to talk with the dead during the last 10 years of his life. Photography was invented in 1837, and this new media soon revealed facts about the world that were invisible to the eye. In 1895, the x-ray exposed the body's hidden interior, further inspiring faith in photography's power to picture the invisible. One of the most important scientists of the 19th century, Sir William Crookes, whose work paved the way for the invention of television, spent 30 years investigating seances. And he was the first to photograph seances. Here is the first image of a fully materialized uh, spirit taken in Crookes' living room. Creative figures were also inspired by spiritualism, including William Butler Yeats, who channeled his novel, A Vision, through the mediumship of his wife. The Surrealists famously co-opted spiritualist techniques of automation and their use of the trance state. But now, art historians are acknowledging that spiritualism helped ignite the very birth of modern art. Spiritualist artists such as Georgiana Houghton and Hilma of Clint are now confirmed as pioneers of abstract painting both predating Kandinsky, known as the father of abstract art. And in Houghton's case, her works uh, predate Kandinsky by over 50 years. And it's just a very exciting time to be talking and revisiting spiritualism. Uh, in 2019, Hilma Ofklint's retrospective at the Guggenheim in New York was the most popular exhibition in the museum's history and its best-selling catalog. And um, it's, it's being reassessed in many areas. Spiritualism's astounding cultural legacy was my first big shock. Learning things like how American President Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd hosted seances in the White House. But my second surprise was finding that spiritualism and photography had been connected since their beginnings. This link between spiritualism and photography became a primary focus of uh, my art and my research. Spiritualism's photographic past is one of the most bizarre, absurd, and uniquely unsettling chapters within the history of photography. And one of the mi most mind-blowing things for me was realizing that it was the first religion to create an iconography using the new medium of photography. Um, you could say spiritualism is to photography as Catholicism is to painting. And my work became an attempt to build onto this strange record. I discovered spiritualism as a teenager after my cousin received a message from a medium in Lilydale that revealed details about my grandfather's death that proved to be true. Since then, I became deeply, deeply curious about how a total stranger could have known this family secret. And so this personal experience through my cousin was what led me to the project. And I knew almost nothing about spiritualism when I began photographing in Lilydale in 2001. And at first, I could not understand how sane people 
could t be saying that they were talking with dead people, but I was so curious about their beliefs and their experiences and about their lives. And I wanted to learn um, everything I could about Lily Dale and about spiritualism and about mediumship. So I wandered around and knocked on doors and introduced myself to people in the town. And I asked them to tell me about spiritualism and they very graciously did, they welcomed me. And I just wandered around endlessly making pictures of their art, of their museum, uh, the lake in the town, spiritual healings, spoon bending classes, and I eventually got the nerve to ask um, some of the mediums to let me sit down on their readings with their clients. Uh, but I was constantly questioning how to photograph spiritualism. Um, how do you photograph the exchange between a veiled presence and a visible body? Uh, eventually I was allowed to bring my camera into seances, but I struggled with how to be true to the psychological reality of these events. I constantly asked, uh, myself, how do you photograph the invisible? Soon, soon I came to have um, some happy accidents with my camera. And this is one, I was in um, a circle, a seance circle at night, and there was a red flashlight, and we were passing around the flashlight. And you're supposed to say what you see um, when the people would pass the flashlight and sit and meditate. And it's a thing called transfiguration and spiritualism. And this woman took the flashlight and everybody was seeing a second face right next to her face. Oh, it looks like you, but it's not you. It's floating right next to you. Well, maybe it's your doppelganger. Oh, maybe it's your grandmother. Maybe it's that voodoo priestess, Marie Laveau. I did not see the second face. I saw a woman holding a flashlight and I tried to make a straightforward photograph of it. But this is the picture I got. Um, and, you know, in this low light situation. And, this accidental photograph was more psychologically true to the event than any straight photograph I could have made or, or thought to make. And I found this accident, this coincidence, thrilling. And it was synchronistic. It was uncanny. And this is another early accidental picture. Mm -hmm. I was making portraits of this woman in the museum, and I got two orbs, purple orbs, and different, different rolls of film, different parts of the a frame, different pictures of her. And I thought it was just so weird and I printed them and I brought them to her and I said, I got these weird pictures of you in the, in, last week in the museum. And she took them in her hand and she looked really carefully and she paused for a long time and then said, oh, that's Bob. And she meant her, she was talking about her deceased husband, that um, that was his energy. He showed up in my photos and this is, this is the first time I had ever even thought of an anomaly in a, in a picture being meaningful or being assigned meaning. Uh, and it was also in the Lilydale Museum where I first was introduced to the spirit photographs. And I unexpectedly stumbled upon these pictures and I became fascinated by them. I had never heard the term spirit photography before. I was really shocked to learn about this history. These images were not acknowledged in any of the textbooks I studied from. And I was really blown away by these pictures. I was shocked by their absurdity and their outrageousness and their oddness and their tenderness and how they spoke about grief and love and loss. But it was the pictures of spiritualist mediums in action that became of most interest to me. And discovering ectoplasm the bodily excretion that was said to morph into form that really blew my mind. I found photographs of ectoplasm shocking. These images were highly strange and grotesque and oddly beautiful. They were the most uniquely unsettling photographs I had ever encountered. And I desperately wanted to decode these images and I wanted to know what they meant and I wanted to understand what ectoplasm even was. And so I think for many of us, myself included, you may have first heard the term ectoplasm via the movie Ghostbusters. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, who co-wrote and created Ghostbusters, is actually a fourth generation spiritualist. And he's drawing the term straight from spiritualist practice. And Ghostbusters was directly inspired by the seance diaries of Dan's great grandfather. and. Dan wrote the foreword for my book and he very graciously allowed me to use his family spirit photo of his uh, 
great grandfather that was taken in, in Lilydale. Ectoplasm has made other appearances in visual culture. Here's one by the artist Mike Kelly that predates Ghostbusters. And here's a more recent example of ectoplasm in the art world from Tony Orsler's 2015 film Imponderable. And then there's also examples like this spooky ghost scene from South Park. And I'm, I'm trying to make the point that there is a cultural awareness of ectoplasm that has been separated from spiritualism. Within these recent examples, the visionary artist Paul LaFolle with his statement, ectoplasm unites life with death, comes closest to explaining ectoplasm's authentic meaning. The word ectoplasm is taken from the Greek, ectos plus plasma, meaning outside formed. It's a paradox. It's a substance that's supposed to be spiritual and material. It's a, it's a substance that's supposed to merge or bring together the realms of life and death. It was named by Charles Roche, a Nobel Prize winner in medicine. And in Roche's description, it's an extension of the medium's body that creates a form for itself and seems to come to life. In the Victorian era and into the early 20th century, serious attempts were made to study ectoplasm. Some compared it to natural phenomena like plasma, spider webs, slime molds, the chrysalis of caterpillars, or the pseudopods of protozoa. But there's the problem of cross-cultural evidence why doesn't ectoplasm appear in other cultures or throughout the ages? It seems to move across the world only after the photographs have been shared. Some argue that psychokinetic abilities are often accessed through a technique of visual focus. An example is how paintings and sculptures of levitation and stigmata serve as inspiration for the bodily feats of saints, like St. Joseph of Cupertino or St. Catherine of Siena. Others point to the shamanic concept of spiritualized phlegm as a cross-cultural example. It's when the plant medicine combines with the shaman and he uses it for healing his, his own um, biochemistry. But of course, scandal has also surrounded ectoplasm. Houdini famously hated it. Here is a fake ectoplasm photo he commissioned of himself. Houdini appears to Houdini. And uh, this juicy read from 1977 lays bare how some scam seances were executed. And so eventually, most spiritualist churches distanced themselves from ectoplasm and darkroom seances. And instead, spiritualism began focusing on almost exclusively clairvoyant mediumship, much like you see on the popular TV shows, like the Long Island Medium with like, bright rooms and tissue boxes and just people having a conversation with uh, candles. Um, so yeah, it's a very different aesthetic. And spiritualism, I, I just want to make the point too that spirit photography has always been controversial and it's even controversial for spirit spiritualists. Not everybody feels the same way about it. There's a lot of believing spiritualists who absolutely hate spirit photography. There's others that believe some, are, some of the vintage pictures are true, some are not. There's no dogma, there's no hierarchy. Everybody has a different feeling about it in spiritualism. But many of the mediums I met told me that they believed in the reality of ectoplasm. And I could not help but wonder if there are mediums out there somewhere still trying to produce it. And this led me to the Arthur Finley College, which is a learning center for spiritualists outside of London. And the best way to describe it is like a Hogwarts for adult spiritualists. And I mean this in the best way. People travel from all over the world and they try to study there. And Arthur Finley College has always kept the ectoplasmic seance alive, even you know, when it was unfashionable. And this is one of the news pictures of a documentation. I traveled there in 2003 to attend a course as a student. And I finally saw a real mediums cabinet. And the week was filled with classes and demonstrations. And here's one of many exercises on how to use a mediums cabinet. And this was my seance classroom. All week, every morning and afternoon, we sat in the dark and sang, calling the spirits in, asking them to appear. We were told ectoplasm is very dangerous to produce and that only the very best mediums can produce it. And each of us as students had to take a turn in the cabinet to see what would happen. But by, you know, by the middle of the week, there, there was no ectoplasm appearing, and our teacher was starting to get frustrated, and everybody was starting to get frustrated, and then we were told, 
it was probably because all of us in the class were just really bad mediums. And our teacher was a very good medium, but it, we, were, we were so bad, we were even ruining his psychic faculties. So everyone got really down and was really upset and, you know, that nobody was good at this. And so all week there was one student in the class who kept saying, but seriously, I don't understand at home. I really am good at this. Like, I, I can get ectoplasm. I, I swear I do at home. And so frustrated, she walk, walked in the classroom full of, like, toilet tissue all over her face and sticking out of her shirt and collapsed in a chair and said, oh, look, I've got some. And uh, that joke was as close as we got to ectoplasm that week. And this wax artifact in that museum. And so around this time, I became very frustrated photographing spiritualism. And I felt stuck. And I felt like it's not really something you could do a proper documentary about. Um, and I was just unsure I would ever encounter anything that was mysterious to photograph. And I, I stopped working on the project. But I found I couldn't stop thinking about spiritualism. So I started reading about spiritualist history and psychical research and parapsychology and shamanism and the anthropology of ritual. And these are two of the books that made me rethink the topic and taught me to embrace the ambiguity that I was observing. And during this research period, I learned about a thing called instrumental transcommunication and the use of technology in combination with mediumship and how spiritualists used video cameras, audio recorders, still cameras, and radios. And the, the merging of the ITC movement with spiritualism was largely a result of the famous Skoll experiments in the 90s in England. Skoll caused quite a controversy, with some insisting it to be the best physical evidence of spirit communication ever made. And the Skoll group created a large amount of audio, video, and photography, and I became very inspired by this visionary use of technology. And I was struck by the holiness of the photographic material and how, at Skoll, photographic artifacts were the vehicle for this communication, this otherworldly communication, and this theme of pictures and picture of pictures they had, and um, photographs as, you know, this primary relic. And um, Skoll reported a wide variety of photographic phenomena, including levitating cameras that took pictures by themselves. And even plans for an auto communication device designed by the spirit of Thomas Edison, sent to their seance room etched onto a roll of Kodachrome film. So I wanted to learn what was happening in seances with photography. And so, um, I started to, to try and find people who were using it in, in their seances. And this is one of the practices I discovered. It's called scotography, where they literally set up a dark room inside a seance room, and photographic material is used for messages. And I went back to Arthur Findlay College and tried to learn about the technology and met mediums who were using uh, technology in their practice. And I became very inspired by their DIY attitude and their technical rule breaking and all of their experimental processes and their use of play and how they combined and used their instruments as an extension of their senses. And then I discovered that spiritualist photography was evolving in the digital age um, through something called orb photography which is probably considered the primary, it's, it's like the spirit photography of today. It's like very popular. And much has been written about this movement as to whether orbs are simply just dust particles, water drops, or camera glitches. But for orb photographers, this debate is beside the point. The point of an orb is to interact with it. The main technique is called orb calling, where you invite the orbs to appear. And um, many of the people online who spearheaded this community were grieving mothers who were using this technique to talk to their deceased children. And they would call in the orbs, direct them into patterns, use computer software to zoom in and search for symbols and faces. I also, uh, so I began researching her, mediums who are using photography, and I do a lot of this research on Facebook, and there are some that use thermal cameras, some that do these 3D images with the iPhone. 
and I was struck by how much they look like sonograms, some of them. And there's another technique that's uh, popular with several mediums where they use their eyeglasses to scry. And this is when the medium sits in trance with glasses on and photographs reflections. I, I included a few examples because it's kind of hard to see, but they say the spirits come in right over their eyes on the glasses. And then they, they post them online and try to pair them with, um, for messages to people. So the ITC practitioners inspired some of my own photographic experiments that appear in the book. This is a water scrying experiment with researchers in Liverpool. This is a water scry at Loch Ness, smoke scrying, and orbs. I tried orb photography. I'm pretty bad at it, but every once in a while I get a good orb photo. And this one, this one there's one in the show, and there's also this one um, I took in Italy with a band of orb photographers, and they said, we're going to go and, and take our cameras. And I said, I'll take my camera, but I'm not going to get any orbs. I never get orbs. And they said, oh, no, if we go to the mountains and say our prayers, you will get orbs. And I took this photo, and it's um, orb upon orb upon orb. And it still amazes me, because I'm not really sur sure what happened in this picture. In terms of my own experiments, the medium I've been working with the longest and most intensely is Sylvia Howarth, who features prominently, prominently in the book and in this show. Sylvia is incredibly creative. She's a true artist herself. I could do an entire presentation on her work. This is a camera obscura she installed in her bedroom. And here's Sylvia using a Xbox motion camera. Uh, so she'll have the, the Xbox camera track her body and then she'll direct it and ask the spirits to come in and communicate. In this one, she's asking it to shake hands. And Sylvia takes videos of herself and she captures the video at points of corruption using these digital riffs to illustrate her experience of the ineffable. And there are thousands of these corrupted screen grabs, which she compiles into digital notebooks. And there, so she had like thousands of these, and um, they inspired what I ended up like when I was working with her. This, uh, her work inspired mine, this idea of her morphing or deconstructing or the spiritual concept of masking, where um, you, know, you see other things on a, a medium's face, or this idea of blending or merging that spiritualists talk about. And many spiritualist mediums claim celebrity spirit guides, and that was a surprise. Um, some of the most popular, such as Michael Jackson, Freddie Mercury, and Louis Armstrong are painted on these spirit trumpets. Uh, which were handmade by Sylvia. And here's a view of her seance space where she actually did some paintings uh, or some drawings of their celebrity spirit guides. And this is Sylvia's husband, Chris Howarth, who is also a medium. Mm -hmm. And one of his main spirit guides is Louis Armstrong. And uh, there's a lot of drama about Louis Armstrong because some mediums will say, Louis Armstrong only comes to my seances. He does not go to Chris Howard's seance. There's a lot of like territorial stuff about these celebrity mediums. And this is a picture of Chris visiting the Louis Armstrong medium in New York City. And here's Chris speaking in trance as Louis Armstrong. And yeah, this is another one I recorded. This is Elvis Presley. So I want to switch gears and get back to this mystery of ectoplasm and my search for it. And I ended up traveling all over England and parts of Europe to document mediums who said they were working with ectoplasm. But what I discovered was that most physical mediums had their own interpretation of the term ectoplasm. And when they told me they were working with ectoplasm, most were not talking about the white gauzy streams that you see in the vintage images. The word ectoplasm was used to refer to temperature changes, feelings, smells, or hypnotic perceptions. This ectoplasmic power could be responsible for any of the effects they were trying to create, including healing. Ectoplasm could be material, but it could also be invisible energy, a force that could act upon the body. And I thought about my early accidental photographs, and I began to consider how photography's automatic process sometimes renders the perfect metaphor for invisible situations. And so th this is one example. Um, 
<clears throat> I was working with this medium and she said, I don't want you to take any long exposures. People say that we're cheating, so just take fast exposures or as fast as you can. I said, okay, I will. And at one point in the seance, her, she goes into a trance and her spirit guide addresses me and says, I want you to take one long exposure and I'll show you my mask. And this is the picture I made. And so I started to really play with the process and became excited by crossing the boundary of what is considered bad in photography, what's, what's bad, like a bad photograph. And I invited Photographic Anomaly and I saw pictures that contain both mechanical and spiritual explanations require an interpretation. This approach considers the conjuring power of photography itself and embraces the mystery of who or what is the medium. So I want to get back to this concept of literal ectoplasm, like the white streams we saw earlier in the vintage pictures. And the most famous and controversial ectoplasmic medium in the world right now is a man named Kai Mugi from Germany. And in 2013, I had my first opportunity to photograph Kai, who was different from most of the other mediums I met. When Kai said that he produced ectoplasm, he meant exactly like the white gauzy streams seen in the vintage images. Uh, being in his seance, it was a truly surreal experience, like watching the vintage photographs jump to life right in front of my eyes. According to Kai, ectoplasm is a device, a screen for projection, a place to put the unarticulated. According to Kai, ectoplasm can act as a physical place for the ineffable. And he describes ectoplasm as a flesh that is literally born, a living, breathing substance. And so I asked Kai, why? Uh, what's the purpose of these seances? What is the purpose of going around and producing ectoplasm in, in these seances? And he said there are two reasons. One, ectoplasm has healing powers, and this healing is a byproduct that comes about through the attempt to merge the material and spiritual realms. And two, it's to get people out of their own heads. Kai says, we are not trying to make anyone believe anything. We are just happy if at least they have one thought outside of their normal thought pattern during our seance. So soon after I made my photographs with Kai, um, he was accused of fraud by several of the parapsychologists who were studying him, including um, Stephen Brody, a professor emeritus from UMBC. He has a long um, relationship with Kai and has written many things about him. And this developed into a full-blown scandal, and there was a debate revolving around Kai's eBay account and if he purchased two kilograms of Halloween spiderweb material. I think he was hacked. I don't know. It was a, it was a very, it was a very um, big paradrama moment in, in, in parapsychology. Um, and I was wondering, what would Kai do next? Was he going to hang it up? Was he going to stop these seances? But no, he, he came back, and what he did was shocking. He brought back full form materializations into spiritualism. And this had not happened in a very long time. I mean, you could say maybe over 80 years. And it was really shocking to many that Kai was started to publish on his own blog these images. And you may remember earlier these images um, from William Crooks uh, that I showed. And here is Kai manifesting some of those same spirits. Um, and when I saw these images, I decided I had to go and see these materializations for, him, for myself. And so I called Kai and I said, I want to come and like, photograph these new seances you're doing. And he said he only does them in Switzerland and Germany and that I could come, but there would be no guarantee that anything would happen or that I would get a picture. And I said, that's OK. And I took the chance and I went to Switzerland. And I went to a seance and there was a materialization and I made this picture. And Kai is very, um, he directs all of all the images about himself and I went with the, with the promise that I'm not gonna put anything out that you don't want out. And so I, he's like, as soon as you get home, send me this image. And so I send him the picture and he's like, 
oh gosh, it's just awful. This picture is terrible, can never be shown. And he said that this picture was literally a mediumistic preterm birth of the spirit of Colonel Henry Alcott. And it was because he was so nervous that I was coming to his seance that um, it was a botched materialization. And so I was really disappointed that I did get a picture, but I wasn't going to be able to show it. But three weeks later, um, Alcott reappeared to Kai's um, in-house photographer, Marcus Kepler, and he got the perfect shot of the perfectly formed Alcott. So then I was allowed to use my image as like a comparison. So it ended up working out. Uh, I'm going to draw this part to a close right now. Um, with some of the strangest stories uh, of making photographs in spiritualism, and, and they happened with a medium named Gordon Garforth. And when I first met Gordon Garforth, um, he just seemed like a really normal, nice guy, and he's, uh, he's a, a longtime spiritualist. His wife is also from a spiritualist family, and he said, yes, I go into trance, and ectoplasm changes the shape of my hands and my face, and you'll see this in my seance. And I thought, you know, I'm probably not going to see that, but I'm, I'm going to go anyway with my camera. And I was really doubtful anything would happen. And so I was invited. I brought my camera. This is what it looks like with, your light, with the lights on. And about 20 minutes into the seance, Gordon's wife, Gaynor, announced that the spirits would now use ectoplasm on Gordon's hands. And, the, and he held out his hand, and he, it, he started to move it in front of his body. And the next thing I saw was this gigantic hand. And to me in my seat, it looked as if his flesh just skipped into a gigantic form. And I screamed. And that's really impolite in a seance. It's a very bad thing to do. <laughs> You're really not supposed to do it. And um, then everybody else in the seance started screaming too. And I was thinking, are they screaming because I'm screaming? Or are they seeing this hand? Or like, no. Then I convinced myself that I, because then he moved it back and it was gone. And I convinced myself that I had hypnotically rendered the hand in my mind's eye because I, he had prepared me to see his hand change. But when I got my images back, downloaded, I saw this gigantic, grotesque hand that was just as spooky as what I saw with my eyes. And um, I just love that this picture has multiple interpretations and that um, it's really a mystery to me what happened that day. And it's probably one of the strangest things that ever, I've ever seen. It was very magical. And I also photographed Gordon in a trance session where he told me he, his, you know, his face would change. And um, he talked a lot about these uh, masking and a lot spiritualists talk about these ectoplasmic masks that appear and there's a long tradition of this in spirit photography and also in throughout spiritualism and um i documented the session with gordon using long exposures and in every picture i made gordon looked very different and these are um some of the pictures i made and then there was this picture and i almost didn't want to put this on I ended up giving him all these pictures on a, a hard drive. And I didn't want to put this picture on because I, it was like a little spooky. The, the mustache looked like a little bit like Hitler-esque. And I was like, oh gosh, I don't want to give him this picture. But he saw it on the screen and he said, that picture, that is the picture. That is the best picture you did. I love that picture. And so I put it on the thumb drive and I didn't think about this picture again. And then I was back in England six months later and he invited me to his home. And he said, I have to show you something. And he brought out this carte de visite of his great grandfather. And so um, this was one of the strangest photographic synchronicities I had uh, as an experience when I was playing with the, the photographic process in these seances. And um, Gordon believes that it's his, it's his great grandfather as seen in this image. And this is, this is in the show also. Um, so that's, that's usually where I end my talk. But um, I'm going to go on just a little bit. I'm going to share, uh, I'm working on two works of progress right now. 
And um, the first one, I mentioned this book earlier, The Perfect Medium, and fans of that book may recognize some of these pictures. Um, these are from the SORAC group. It was an experimental um, SCI research group that was extensively documented, documented by two of its members, or by its members, uh, John Thomas Richards and his wife Elaine. And SORAD is important for a variety of reasons, um, two being that the group was started by John G. Nyhart, the American Poet Laureate of Nebraska, who is best noted for his book Black Elk Speaks, one of the most widely read works in American Indian literature. So Nyhart started this group. And then it evolved into this 50 year long project that is one of the most exotic uh, cases in the history of cyclical research. And they made films, uh, uh, they have tons of photographs, audio, uh, the archive is absolutely astounding. Um, and they were studied by some of the most significant figures in parapsychology, including J.B. Rhines. So there's pictures with them with the who's who of parapsychology. And so um, myself and the sociologist Jim McLennan are working with Elaine Richards to save this massive archive. And we're going to do a book about it. And right now I'm editing um, all their photographs, which has like been a really exciting, because um, a lot of it's never been seen before and it's really astounding stuff. And then just quickly what I've been doing lately is dur uh, during the pandemic I wanted to continue photographing mediums. Um, but you know, there's travel restrictions and restrictions on in-person interaction and photography requires presence. But um, I took inspiration from the spiritualists and their tradition of experimentation with media and technology. And I began um, going on Skype and Zoom and FaceTime and photographing mediums. And this, this spiritualist idea that um, otherworldly communication can't be bound by time or space. So like playing with this concept. So these three images have been the, of the medium Isabel Duchesne in trance via Skype. And these are some FaceTime experiments with my friend and longtime collaborator Lily Del Medium, Lauren Thibodeau. And these are a few experiments led by the medium Kim Moore Cullen via Zoom. And she had like, we had a, a whole, like a really intricate system with Kim. And um, we had audio going and it's, it's still a lot of material. And this is one of Kim. And then these are some, uh, this is slightly a, more of a domestic setting with my friends, EVP researchers, Jack and Margaret, and they, they do their sitting and I'm on Zoom uh, or Skype photographing them. And that's just a little work in progress. And that's, that's the end. <laughs> I was faster than I thought I would be, so I guess I have time for questions. Anybody else? Oh, I saw you first. You, you had a picture maybe like five minutes ago where you were in a seance and you said like the person, someone like talked to you or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, with the, I was directed by the woman. The medium was entranced and it, while she was entranced, I was directed. Well, she was speaking. Um, the yeah, it, I mean, the, she would be speaking as her spirit guide. So it was her, it's coming through her body, but she's saying it was not her. It was her spirit guide telling me what to do with the, ca the camera. So the, it, it, it touches on this weird thing in spiritualism also with this like authorship. Like what is, what is, who is really authoring this? What's really happening? You know, I'm taking the photo, the medium is there. But, it, but she's directing me through this other aspect of her persona. Per, per, like, so that, that's, what it, that's what happened in that situation. And then the last photo you showed was with one of the screenshots with the guy with like, the like, like an ectoplasm or something, the older guy. Yeah. Um, so that's, so, so uh, they're, um, they do a lot of EVP research and, and in ITC or instrumental trans communication, 
a lot of times you're using things to scry. So that was like some vapor smoke. So he'll, he will um, vape and just, he, he'll sit and he'll vape. And then I'll be on the other side of the screen, like photographing the vape through the screen. So that's what's happening. Were there questions <clears throat> that you started with 20 years ago that are answered or unanswered? Okay, that's a good question. And what, what I usually say is, I, I can honestly say like standing from where I am, I have more questions than I have answers and that's not a cop out, it's true. It's, I've had, my experience like really spanned the gamut. Like I, I often say I'm in it for the comedy because I do have a lot of really good funny stories about the high absurdity and level strangeness and like total paradrama, like turf wars with mediums and like, all, like it gets really juicy sometimes. But um, I also have had like really profoundly strange experiences and really clear messages that have touched me deeply. So I have to be honest and say, like when I first started, I really was so green. I was, you know, I was Catholic. I never went to a medium, although my all my cousins were Catholic, and they would they would go a lot. Of, there's a lot of there's a big there's a lot of you'll find in Lilydale ex priests and nuns who practice as mediums. Uh, the man who was the president of Lilydale last year, he was a former monk. So there's a lot of like overlap, um, but yeah, like I I just couldn't understand and. Um, and then I, I did have some in, intense experiences. And often in Lilydale, I'll meet people who say, they'll say, I never thought I'd be at a place like Lilydale. And th the fact that I'm even here astounds me. But I love that um, Lilydale kind of holds the space for these type, when people have weird experiences and they go to Lilydale to process them, or uh, oftentimes they, they will. That's one of the things that happens in Lilydale. So did you find meaning over two decades of work? I mean, you're not done. Yeah, yeah, I did, but and also I found um, just like a tr uh, I I was actually absolutely astounded to find how much overlap there was with art and photography and spiritualism and how much they use art in their just to, like they'll use art they'll do drawings like a lot of like the automatic process it made it and then the more I kind of played with the automatic process the more I find in the automatic process and that. That, I, that I'm actually working in a tradition that I just didn't know existed or that is, was, was through all the work that I loved, but I just didn't know it was there. So, I guess. I guess. What camera did you use? Um, so, I, in the beginning I used film, 35 millimeter film. I've used some medium format, but that didn't, I didn't really, that didn't work out so well. I liked being faster. Now I use all digital. Um, an interesting thing about this show and the, some of the work that's on the walls, I could never print in a color dark room. And a lot of the, the detail, even in the film, I couldn't get until I got like a real good digital scan because red is so not sensitive. And especially in the dark room, it would just look like a blast of just red. But you, now that I'm di using the digital process, I can get that detail back. And then in camera raw, I can even go really far into the dynamic range. And so the possibilities for low light photography now are so much better. So I, I am, I'm, I'm experimenting with that, like, like spreading out the dynamic range. And um, like the, some of the, the stuff I showed that I got on the screen, I could never have gotten on film. Like, I don't think. That's a good question too, um, because it's that, but it's also like when you're photographing mediums, you're re photographing very sensitive people too. And so that was a, another ask, reason why I didn't get the work out into the world like for a really long time, because I couldn't just like take the pictures and then put them out there. Like, so most of the people in my photos, I have like a real working relationship with, and every single thing in my book was approved. Like. People saw what picture would be used, what words would go with it, what the title would be. 
Um, and, and so that woman, uh, Kim, uh, I just took the picture not knowing her. It was in an orb photography class, but then I sent it, I got her contact information and I followed up and she like loves the picture. And so I sent her a copy of the book and like she was very excited about it. And so I was done with her permit, with her permission. That was, when I was working as a journalist, that was one of my um, really big problems with it. It's like going somewhere and like photographing something that's really emotional and then leaving and not knowing and then just putting it out in the world. I always had a tough time doing that. And it's, e it's even more so with mediums because they are very, like they're sharing, it's, it's, a, it's very collaborative. Like they're sharing this very intense, performative process. It's very performative. So it, it's a lot. Related. Um, do you feel as though the work that you've been doing in these small communities has had an effect on the communities themselves? Like, do you feel that you've had a changing effect in the way that they see themselves or um, their own imagery? May, I, maybe a little bit in the, um, so, some of the, some people who are attracted to spiritualism or, or new at it don't, they don't even know the history. Or like I've been able to make some, I don't know if this really answers it, but like when I started showing the work, I started to realize, oh, there's art historians doing new work. There's um, people relook, there's history of medicine people looking at this history and nobody in Lilydale knew that was happening. They were just like, and so bridging, the, I, I've helped bridge the gap between theory and practice a little bit. like. And also, I'll meet people who like did their whole life's work on spiritualism, but they had never met a medium before. And so, like you, see, it's both sides. And I think in every discipline, theory and practice, they're so far apart. So I do see that my work helps that come together. Yeah. Susan, well, I'll, I'll go. Susan. I'll. Well, it's it's so interesting. You were saying. Well, I mean, there's all, also like, there's the, the fraud stuff. And like, it, in my presentation, I really, I know my focus. That's a long time ago. Have they gotten over it? Well, I mean, but I guess that maybe this is a point, and I don't know if I'm really answering, but like the whole fraud thing exists. And obviously there are people who fake things, or sometimes I'll see a medium who is probably a sincere practitioner, but I think they're totally full of crap. Like, I mean, you, you know, but I don't, I don't know if they're, um, you know, and historically there's been big time frauds and it's so embedded in it, it's just part of it. But um, yeah, because I guess you look at a photograph and you just think, oh, double exposure. Uh, or, you, you know what I mean? Like you can, with the art, it's, um, it's totally different because it's organic in a way that photography isn't. Like photography still is mechanical in a way. Like, like. Um, but what I what I started to see is that, like, they were symbolically profound, the spirit photographs, and they communicated the ideas of spiritualism very clearly, and that they touch on this, you know, this um, this I, the mysterium tremendum, like. This idea that the holy is also scary, like it should be shocking, like it, it should um, it 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 should like take you aback in a way that you it, it's almost like grotesque, you know. So, um, and I mean that's that's why I was trying so hard to understand the early photographs because they are so strange. I I, I think they're like the strangest images in the history of of photo or early photo. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so, oh, different question than originally. Um, 
you said that you've been to some mediums that you you're like, this is sincere, or you think it's sincere, but you know, you you, you have this sense that it, it it could be full of crap. So, what do you do with the photos from those sessions? Do you say, you know, this could be an amazing photo? Maybe it's very you know illustrative of the event, but if you came away from it thinking that this might not be on the up and up, do you then say, I'm not going to use it? Um. No, because then I wouldn't have a book. Because, like, <laughs> but, but I mean, what I mean is, um, I talk about this in the book. Like, some mediums are like, I can't believe he's in your book. Why? I, I can't be in your book if he's in your book. Or like, th this person, th like, you, you know what I mean? And also, too, I'll be honest, sometimes, like, the most amazing mediums are people who I th I've seen do, like, phenomenal things that really blow my mind. Sometimes I see them and they're, I'm like I don't I don't know what's happening here today. Like, <laughs> so it's there's a lot of ambiguity, like a lot of just a lot of strange ambiguity. Like this performative thing is is very much there, and it's very much part of it. And actually, there's a lot of ties to spiritualism in early showbiz. Like, there's a great book about that um, called Supernatural Entertainments where he talks about like how this really fed early um, showbiz, a lot of spiritualist techniques and, and early, early happenings. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just part of it. It's part of the high ambiguity. Like, so I don't discern anything and I leave everything open to whoever's um, viewing to decide what's happening. Well, I was just going to say, I give you a lot of really good wishes dealing with UFO stuff because that's, for me, if in all things paranormal, that's the biggest hall of mirrors there is, in my opinion. Um, and it relates to, to mediumship. And, and there's a lot of connections. Once you get into the paranormal, it's all connected. Um, so, I mean, when I say seriously, take things seriously, but not literally, I mean, I'm saying that there's a set, like, there's a symbolic importance here that you don't have to believe in mediumship to appreciate and understand. But I also think there's something deep, um, deeply like, like um, primordially religious, like a religion that is very visceral ha happening that um, our day and time just has a hard time understanding. And I've seen a lot of like, a lot of beautiful healing happening in, this, in these situations as well. Um, so I, I, my only advice is to read The Trickster and the Paranormal by George Hansen, and that's like a great starting ground to, um, as a way of working. And um, George is a good friend of mine, and I read his book, and it changed everything for me. And now, now thankfully, we are friends, and he actually has mentored me in a lot of ways. But I, I probably would have stopped doing my work had I not found that book. I'm oh. curious about like, how, what was that change for you and how? Because you can, in that book, it basically says that you're never going to cleanse, you're never going to find a pure experience. Like, you're, this, is, this is a mishmash. And, and like, it'll never be, you're not, there's, there's something important here, but it can't be pulled apart and put into boxes in the way that we want to do that. And um, that you have to accept that if you're gonna, inter if you're gonna interact with this, this kind of a material. And so like, it, it's just, I'm, I know I'm in a strange position because I'm almost like a researcher and an artist, but, but I, that was the only way I could move forward. It was like understanding, if you start reading the literature and reading a lot like of the study of ritual and anthropology, I mean, that helped me a lot. All of that. Is there 
no other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Shannon. That was so <laughs>